Folks, today we're going to continue our lesson on continuity editing with a shift from space to time. This is continuity editing and temporal comprehension. Uh, the first thing we're going to look at is transitions. When I say transitions, I simply mean how do you get from one shot to the next? Most conventionally, you get from one shot to the next with a cut. And this is a special kind of cut we'll talk about in a bit. But there are other kinds of transitions between one shot to the next. Um, they can include a fade, such as what you see here, or a dissolve, such as what you see here. We're going to talk about what fades and dissolves generally signify in terms of various forms of temporal ellipsis, that is, eliding over time, showing a gap in time. So fade out and fade in. It's a major temporal ellipsis. Uh, Bordelon Thompson say the Hollywood rule is that a dissolve indicates a brief time lapse and a fade indicates a much longer one. Think about how much this happens in rear window. When you get a fade out like this and then you fade in, it's implied that at least a number of hours have passed. You probably don't realize you know this uh, system, but you do. Um, there's very few dissolves in rear window. In fact, there might not be any dissolves. If you can find them, please let me know. That's because the film is organized in such a way that it's, very, uh, it's a very repetitive pattern. If there are time ellipses, they tend to be uh, gaps of large chunks. Um, let's look at a, another example of a fade out, this time one that implies a greater ellipsis. Very simple. But you'll notice that that fade out actually took a longer time um, than did the one in rear window. That actually helps us get the sense of a longer period of time being elided. After all, Marie Antoinette is taking a long trip via horse and carriage um, from Austria to France. Um, that she, you know, she went, she went to sleep and then she woke up and she's in the middle of uh, playing cards. Um, moving on from fade out and fade in to to dissolve. It's a more minor temporal ellipsis. Check out how it's done in Letter from an Unknown Woman. That's a dissolve. Now this is not saying that hours pass. It's merely saying that she went from this part of her journey to this part of her journey. We're not going to show you the middle part of her journey, right? It's suggesting it's the same basic action, but we're cutting out some time in the middle. Um, how about this from Man Escaped? There's a dissolve right there. And as you'll note, a lot of parts, many parts of this escape scene uh, suggest long periods of time, but this uh, dissolve suggests it's not a long period of time. We're merely going to cut out some of that time to get to the next point of the action. Dissolve is a minor temporal ellipsis. Now, I say that, but there are always exceptions. And part of understanding classical continuity editing is understanding that there are exceptions that are still more or less classical. Check out this use of a dissolve, which isn't exactly a minor temporal ellipsis. In fact, I know uh, that you know exactly what it is, even if you haven't seen this film, Casablanca. Okay, now I imagine even if you haven't seen Casablanca, you understand that this is not conveying that say a few minutes have passed, right? Even though it is technically a dissolve, it's not a fade out and a fade in, we dissolve from one image to the, to the next. However, there are other sonic uh, narrative and visual cues that tell us this is not a mere temporal ellipsis signified by a dissolve, but is in fact, say it with me, a flashback. Um, how do I get a sense that it's a flashback? So many reasons. Uh, one 
is you get that thing in a flashback where a character is pausing to reflect, right? Notice that Humphrey Bogart is not talking to anyone. He's by himself. He's looking in a particular direction. He seems absorbed in thought. And that absorption in thought is conveyed partly by the camera pushing in on him. It's also conveyed by the way it dissolves. It's not a clean dissolve. The image starts to deteriorate like this slowly, right? And also, of course, you have to take into account that if you're watching the film, you know that the image that we're getting is the image of Paris. It's a landmark. It is not the place uh, that Humphrey Bogart is currently in. Therefore, we would have to imagine um, that this is some kind of memory that he is conjuring. Um, also, the music signifies that this is a great leap into a new time and place. Um, that it's not merely continuing um, the same action. Uh, a similar thing goes on here. It's a dissolve, but it's not merely temporal ellipsis. If this reaches you, you will know how I became yours when you didn't know who I was, or even that I existed. I think everyone has two birthdays. So you'll see that a lot like the uh, example that I just showed you, this has other visual cues than merely dissolving. The image is deteriorating in a special way um, before we actually dissolve from one image to the next. And we actually learn, or the film teaches us, that this is going to be the way in which we cut from uh, Stefan reading the letter to the projections of the letter itself, right? You become very accustomed to this. And other cues such as the voice of Lisa um, being the projection of, the, of his reading of the letter um, tell us that we're going to move from one realm of reality to another. Another example of dissolve stretching the rules, uh, a set of dissolves, um, but that isn't merely uh, a simple temporal ellipsis. So you wouldn't be ashamed of me. I went to dancing school. I wanted to become more graceful and learn good manners for you. And so I would know more about you and your world. I, I went to the library and studied the lives of the great musicians of the past. So I hope you'll watch this sequence and pay attention to the way it uses dissolves, but notice that it is slightly different from the way dissolves are used as a simple temporal ellipsis. What we're getting here is something close to what we'll talk about in a little bit, a montage sequence, which is a kind of summary of events that share the same kind uh, of, of, of shape. Um, what we're getting is Lisa elaborating the kinds of things that she did in order to better herself in the eyes of Stefan. Right? There's a subject, these kinds of things, and then the dis dissolves separate uh, examples of those things. We don't need to, to know a clear temporal relationship between when she pulled the, the music from the music library um, to when she took dancing lessons. Right? Time doesn't quite matter here. All that matters is that these things happened over a particular period of time, and they share a similar kind of subject matter, bettering oneself for Stefan. That's the kind of language of dissolve that's being used here. Um, another strange instance of dissolve in a film we're going to watch later in the quarter, um, uh, later in the semester, this, I think, is even stranger. Um, this is, I think, pushing the boundaries of, say, conventional classical editing. It's from Vertigo.
So really all I have in mind are those two dissolves, which really do violate all of the conventions that we looked at earlier. These dissolves do not separate a, uh, a good chunk of time. They, they actually separate mere seconds. So there's dissolve number one, and there's dissolve number two. Now, here we have this strange question of what effect does this have? And frankly, all I can really say is it does produce a kind of dreamlike, dreamy effect, which matters a lot for the film Vertigo, which pushes this boundary between waking and dreaming states. And I think this is a good example of stretching the rules in order to invent new kinds of associations or feelings that you can get out of cinematic language. Here's another uh, use of stretching the rules by omission. This is from Man Escaped. J'entends dissonner minuit. Puis une heure. Now this is pushing the boundaries a little bit um, of, from classical technique to almost experimental or you might say modernist technique. We would usually use a fade out to convey this many hours passing, but Bresson doesn't do that. He uses an abrupt cut, what next week we'll call a jump cut. To kind of show us that his fingers have been uh, latched onto that part of the ledge for that much time. Um, it's a kind of shock, uh, a revelation uh, of, of how difficult it's been to remain as quiet for this long. Um, now I'm going to show you an example of uh, a way that a film can invent, once again, its own use of a transition to create really its own kind of system. I haven't really seen something uh, in cinema do it quite like this. This is from a film called Three Colors Blue by Kieslowski. It's a film about grief and it stars uh, Juliette Binoche, whose husband has died in a car accident. And really the film is trying to uh, examine the particularities and the kind of experience of her grief. And it uses the fade out in a very special and unorthodox way to convey a sense of that grief. So something very strange has just happened here, if you're used to the language of uh, dissolves and fade out. So she's been woken up by the sound, and that music that, sh that you're hearing is the sound of um, a particular piece of music that her deceased husband had composed that kind of haunts her uh, as a form of grief. Now, she wakes up from her slumber. She hears the sound, bonjour. bonjour. She turns toward it, and then we get a fade out. Now everything in our, the fiber of our being tells us we're going to emerge to a different scene, right? That the scene just decided to end here and hours will have passed, maybe days will have passed. But instead, fade out, fade back in. Bonjour. And the bonjour re return will tell us that she's actually in the, in the exact same space. And then we're wondering, if this is the first time we've seen this, what the hell does this mean? What the, uh, this is violating a certain uh, convention. And then you only start to understand what it means when you see it done again. So 
So what you come to learn is that the fade out and fade in paired with the music of her deceased husband signifies a kind of moment in which the world becomes too much for her such that she has to kind of take uh, a, a kind of uh, recession into her own consciousness, even if it's not visible to other characters, right? Um, it's like a pause uh, that's, that represents something going on inside. And you only learn that once it's done repeatedly. Um, so those are our transitions, uh, the two kinds, right? Dissolves and, um, and fade outs. Now I want to look at a special kind of cut that can get you from one space to another called the graphic match. Um, so we're going to look at graphic match cuts. Right now I'm going to show you a graphic match dissolve. Basically it's an edit in which a dominant shape or line in one shot provides a visual transition to a similar shape or line in the next shot. I'm going to show you uh, one of the coolest graphic matches that I've ever seen. It's a very clear trick. Um, the uh, doorknob becomes a uh, cue ball. Uh, and it does so in a very, very slipper way. You won't see most graphic matches be this smooth and perceptually interesting. Um, but you will see things like this that are more loose graphical associations. And you can imagine, if you know anything about the traditions of surrealism, that the surrealists and uh, uh, surrealist filmmakers were huge fans of graphic matches. This is one of the most famous uh, surrealist films that we have. It's called Un Chien Andalou, or The Andalusian Dog, by Salvador Dali and Luis Buñuel from 1929. And you'll see you'll get this chain of visual associations. The idea is not that the movement from one thing to another has a logical uh, or even thematic uh, reason for going from one thing to another, but merely the visual similarity between these objects is all uh, that motivates um, the transition. So the ants on a hand uh, have this visual similarity to armpit hair on an armpit because we get the darkness of the hair against the, uh, the, pallid, the pallidness of the flesh. Same, uh, same thing here, um, this kind of uh, prickly an enemy uh, kind of thing against the, the sand. Or then we go to a circular iris, right? Um, that is a graphic match. And if you're narratively ambitious, like uh, Stanley Kubrick is in 2001, you can use the graphic match paired with a certain kind of narrative context to really push the boundaries of temporal ellipsis, which is what happens at the beginning of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, the opening shot, uh, or, the, or the opening sequence in which the ape man, um, after uh, learning to use a bone as a tool and uh, subsequently as a weapon, throws up the bone in triumph. The camera closely follows the bone in the air, and then we get this cut to what looks like a satellite. We've moved thousands of years into the future, creating a kind of cognitive association between the tool of, er of early man to the tools, and Kubrick would uh, suggest weapons, of satellite technology, right? And the similarity of the shapes is the thing that's supposed to kind of um, allow us that kind of giant temporal ellipsis to span 1,000 years in a single cut. Um, other graphic matches you might see in the film that we watched this week, um, Mad Max Fury Road, it's uh, a, a, f a big fan of graphic matches, one of my favorites, um, which is a little bit looser than the uh, ones we just watched, but I still would say a graphic match because we have two circular structures, um, rotating structures next to each other. The opening of the film when we get Mad Max's car, um, you get this circular structure and then a cut to this circular structure, and this should kind of uh, establish a motif of circles throughout the film. Um, what do circles mean? That's up to you to decide. You can think of um, many uh, kind of motivations for this motif, right? Is it because there's a circularity to the plot structure? Um, is it because there is, say, um, an association with um, fertility, as you get with um, this image of um, uh, both reminiscent of a kind of sperm and an egg, right? Um, is it because of wheels and how wheels are so central to this car-centric uh, dystopian future culture? Um, many things that you can kind of think about, um, but uh, it's one way that you can set off a motif is by graphic matches. 
Okay, that's it for transitions. Next time I'll see you for time and editing patterns.